Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Rory and I've had the S5 Mark II for a few days now. Um, I need to start using it on some professional paid gigs and so I had to go through and do a deep dive into the menus to really set it up for my professional workflow. So if you're new to the uh, channel, I do a lot of uh, weddings, events, corporate real estate type gigs, so I need this camera to work exactly as it needs to straight out of the box on day one. So I've spent um, a fair bit of time going through the menus, finding out what everything does, setting it up exactly the way I wanted it to. So in this uh, video, I'm gonna do a really deep dive into the menus for you guys. I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna explain what everything does, um, as well as what settings I use for my professional workflow. So it's gonna be a long one, and if you don't have this camera or you're not interested in cameras, it's probably not the video for you, so you can skip straight away. But yeah, let's just dive straight in and we'll go through it all. All right, so let's just jump straight into the menu. So to actually get to the menus, you press this little menu set button in the middle of the jog wheel there. Um, now I'm gonna run through uh, all the different menus and what I set, and I'm gonna uh, give a little bit of an explanation as I go along. So I'm actually gonna start uh, in the spanner menu here, um, and this is a few of the actual like overall camera settings. Um, if you ever want to see what a setting does, you can actually press the display button down the bottom corner here, and that'll bring up a little uh, brief uh, description of what this setting does. So obviously card format will format the memory card. Now the first thing that I'm gonna change is this double slot function. So by default it's set to record to one card, and then when that card is full, it will start recording to the next one. But I want a backup of all my files, so I set it to backup recording. So it basically makes duplicate copies on the two separate cards that are in the camera. Uh, the next thing that I do in the folder and file settings is I actually change the file name setting. And I've got a different file name setting for each camera that I use and that's so that I can simply organize my footage a lot easier later on. So I've named this one uh, S52. So each file will be S52001, S52002 and so on. Um, the rest of that doesn't matter. Now for thermal management, I've set that to be high. Now what this does is it actually allows you to um, record in the 6K versions for longer than 30 minutes. If you have it set to standard, then it will only allow you to record for 30 minutes at a time in uh, some of the file formats. But I wanna be able to record as long as I want. So I've set it to high and I trust that the camera won't melt. It does give you a warning to say that the camera may become hot while operational and to be careful, but yeah. Uh, the monitor frame rate and the LVF frame rate are live at 60 frames a second. Be aware if this is at 60 frames a second, when you're recording in 24 frames a second, it can look a little bit jittery. If that happens, um, if you get that kind of jittery look, that's why it's because the, record, it's because the frame rate on the monitor is at actually at 60 frames a second. Uh, in here you can change the monitor settings, so if it's not to your liking, you can have a fiddle with that. Um, particularly if you find there's a tint to the monitor. I've found with cameras in the past that there's been like a, a tint to the monitor and I've had to actually adjust in here. Um, this one I've, I've found that it's actually not too bad, but that can actually vary um, monitor to monitor even within the same camera so I've actually made a slight adjustment to one of my S5s because there was a very slight magenta tint to the monitor so I just backed it back into the green a little bit um, just allows you to know what you're recording a little bit better. Uh, the monitor backlight actually comes as auto by standard um, and what this means is when you're recording if you move into bright and dark areas and the um, brightness on the monitor will change but when you're actually using the camera it makes it look like the exposure is changing when it isn't. So I actually set this to just be on a standard one all the time. I've got it set to plus one because I find that plus one is a good kind of level where you can use it um, outdoors in the sun and you can still see the screen, but it's not gonna be completely draining your battery all day. Uh, next is the eye sensor. I actually turn that sensitivity to low so that if you like accidentally like move in front of the um, eyepiece quickly, it's not going to turn it off, um, whereas if you have it, if you like cover that sensor there, then it will move into the viewfinder. Um, if you have it set to regular, then it's a lot easier for it to do it. I mean, even now it's still doing it pretty quickly. So uh, gauge level adjust, if, you're, if your level gauge gets out of whack, then you can have a play with that. 
Uh, the beeping, I turn all the beeping off because I hate it. HDMI connection, I haven't had too much of a play with this yet because at the moment you can't record raw over HDMI. Um, once that ability comes out and you can record raw over HDMI, I will have a bit more of a play with that. And um, yeah, but for the moment I've just left that all standard. Um, one thing that I do notice some people doing is changing this uh, photo luminance level from 16 to 255 to 0 to 255. Um, I leave it at 16 to 255, which is basically IRE 0 to 109. Um, if you change it to 0 to 255, I've noticed that you can get, like, it can do some weird things with stretching the image, and then you've got to, like, play with colour curves and stuff to get it back to what it should have looked like as shot. So I just leave it as uh, 16 to 255. Um, yeah, next one is this, uh, the save to custom modes. And so what I'll do is I normally have um, C1, C2 and C3 set, which if I show you, I don't know whether I can show you, they're basically up here on, on the dial here. Um, you've got C1, C2 and C3. Um, but normally I have one set for, um, I've basically got them all with the same settings, which I'm going to show you now, but I've got one set, I've got each one set for different frame rates. Um, load custom mode, you can actually save your custom, uh, you can actually save your custom modes onto, onto like an SD card and that way if you've got multiple of the same camera, you can put that SD card in another one and just load them all in. Um, obviously your clock, you need to set it and your time zone when you first get it. Now your system frequency, um, this has to do with the frame rates that you have available to you as well as the refresh rate of the electricity in your com in your country. So in Australia we're actually PAL, which is um, 50 hertz. So normally we would record in 25 frames a second or 50 frames a second. Now, when I'm shooting a wedding, I actually like to record in 30 frames a second so that I can slow it down 80% and get that kind of dreamy look. So I've got it set to NTSC, but it doesn't mean that I need to be careful about my shutter speeds because I need to keep my shutter speeds in multiples of 50 to avoid light flickering. Um, and so for that reason, I don't use shutter angle when I'm filming a wedding. If I'm filming a corporate event or uh, something corporate like an interview or an event or something like that, I'll flick this back over to 50 hertz. Um, so that I can keep my shutter angle at 180 degrees. But yeah, for the moment, NTSC. Anytime you change this, you need to turn the camera off and then back on again. And yeah, that's everything. Oh, if you need to update the firmware of the camera or the lens, you can do it in here. You go onto Panasonic, you download the firmware file, you put it on the SD card, and then you can go in and click firmware update and it will update the firmware for you. So yeah, now let's uh, start at the middle because that's where you always start. Um, I'm gonna go up to the uh, the first one up here, which is the movie mode. I should have said at the start, to change all the movie settings, you need to make sure that you're in movie mode on the top dial here. Um, you could do everything else that I just did up until now in any of the modes, because it, that affects all of the modes. But from now on, you wanna make sure that you're in the movie mode on the top. Um, so I'm actually gonna come down to this uh, image format screen to start with because what I want to do, out of the box, this comes set as MP4, and I want to make sure that's in MOV. Um, MOV gives you the best amount of range with the actual image that you're shooting. Um, but the other thing is, if you're in MP4, you actually don't have access to some of the um, some of the menus that we're going to change within these screens. So that's the first thing I do, I change it to MOV. Um, down here, this image area of view, Depending on which format you're recording in, you can either record in full frame, APS-C, or pixel in pixel. Um, because I've got it set at the moment to 5.9K, you can't have that as APS-C because it's using the entire sensor. Um, in this uh, record quality screen, you can access all the different record qualities, um, right down to full HD, um, and right up to open gate 6K. Gives you a little bit of information over the side here. So you can see that um, this 6K, it's full frame, gives you the resolution. It's a three by two aspect ratio. So it's using the entire sensor, which means you have a lot more headroom. 29.97 um, uh, frames per second. Uh, uh, 420 10-bit and it's at 200 megabits per second. So as you flick through these, you can see the different things. You've got different aspect ratios, you've got um, you've got a 17 by 9, you've got 16 by 9 in the 5.9K, which is your standard widescreen. 
where are we? Oh, here we go. A cinema, cinema 4K 16 by, uh, sorry, 17 by 9 aspect ratio. So it has those bars on the top and the bottom. And then just your regular 4K back to a 16 by 9. But um, for the moment, I'm going to set this to 5.9K 30 frames a second, which is normal 16 by 9 aspect ratio, which is how I deliver most of my films. Uh, the slow and quick setting um, is if you're using the S and Q dial on the top here. Um, I actually wouldn't recommend using the S and Q dial on the top here because you actually have available to you now um, full HD in 120 frames per second, but it's at 150 megabit per second. So if you change to S and Q and you want to get 120 frames per second, then it's actually only 100 bit megabit per second. So this is a higher quality uh, slow speed, but there are other uses for S and Q, but yeah, I'm not going to use them. Now we're going to go right back to the start. Um, so exposure mode, we're going to set that to M. Now M for manual, which means that we have full control over both our shutter speed and our aperture. Uh, the photo style, I shoot basically everything in V-Log, but you've got a lot of different styles that you can choose from. Um, if you're shooting video and you want to edit, edit it in post, then either V-Log or one of the Cine-like, either Cine-like D or Cine-like V are normally going to be the best ones for you to use. But yeah, we're going, we're going with V-Log, so that's what I've chosen. Metering mode, I leave as center weighted that measures the entire frame. Dual native ISO, I've actually set that to auto, but you now have the option to set it to low or high. So the low gain setting starts at 640 in VLOG, and the high gain setting starts at 4000. Now, why would you want to change this is if you're in a low light environment and you're having to boost your ISO up to like 30, 30 uh, like around the 3000, 3200 mark, something like that. Um, if you're in auto, it might be using the low gain setting, but if you're in the high gain setting and you bump it down from 4000, then you're gonna get less noise than if you're bumping it up from 640. Um, and that, that's when you might do that. So if you go into a low light environment and you know you're gonna to have to use a high ISO, maybe just set it to high so that you know that the um, camera is using the high gain circuit. Leave it on ISO for the moment. ISO sensitivity, if you're using automatic ISO, you can set where the upper limit is. Um, I've actually found that with these cameras, the upper limit, like even at 51,200, you can get a nice clean image if you're willing to do a bit of noise reduction. So I just leave that at auto. Anytime I use auto ISO, I'm not in low light anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Now, Synchro Scan. Synchro Scan allows you to, I'll show you what it does. So it allows you to adjust the shutter speed by minute amount. So you can see at the start, we were at 100, um, 1 100th of a second. So now we're at 1 100th point 1, 1 100th point 2. Now, if you've ever been in an environment where the lights are flickering and you can't get it to change, Synchro Scan allows you to make those micro adjustments so that you can get that flicker out of the lights. Now, I actually leave this off by default, but I have it mapped to one of my custom buttons and I'll show you my custom buttons a little bit later in the video. Uh, next, you've got the shutter speed gain operation. So this allows you to change your shutter speed from one one hundred uh, from the shutter speed down here, which you can see is this little bit down here. It says one one hundredth of a second, or you can change it to angle, which is ooh, let's change that up to one hundred and eighty degrees. Now, obviously, in the film world, uh, there's that school of thought that you have to keep your shutter angle at 180 degrees. And if you're shooting corporate work, that's somewhat true. Or if you're shooting something with, like, fast motion, that's true, where you want that natural motion blur in there. What I mainly shoot is weddings where there's not a lot of movement and ND filters can be a pain to deal with. So I actually will quite often just crank my shutter. So I basically leave it just so that I can adjust the shutter speed. So that if I need to like really boost the shutter, then I can just do that really quickly without changing my depth of field. All right, and that is pretty much everything I touch in um, that menu. Uh, I don't really worry about any of the diffraction compensation or anything like that. Um, I don't, if there's any kind of compensation that needs to be done, I'll do it in post. Uh, we've just gone through this, uh, this folder, so I'll leave that as is. Next is the focus one. So the first thing I do, this is automatically set to human. You have face and eye there, but interestingly, 
if you set it to face and eye, if the face is further away from the camera, then you're actually not going to, uh, like if, if the subject moves away from the camera, then it won't detect them as a person, which is weird. So I leave it on human because with human, as you get close enough to the camera, it will detect your face and your eye. So leave it on that one, unless you're shooting animals as well, in which case you can leave, turn it to animal and human, but I just leave it on human. Uh, the focus limiter, this is actually a really handy one if you know, if you've got a setup shot and you know where the, um, like the front and the back are, so you can actually set your focus from like, say you wanted to set it from one meter to three meters and you know that your subject's only going to move within that space, you can set it from one meter to three, uh, to three meters and that will be fine. Um, I actually will leave that off. The continuous AF um, I set to mode two, which basically means that the autofocus will work even when you're not recording. So if you have it to mode one, the autofocus only works while you're recording or if you press the like the shutter button halfway. Um, mode two means no matter where you're pointing the camera at any point in time, it's autofocusing. It will use a little bit more battery that way, but the other side of it is that it will mean that you don't have to um, worry about trying to get focus before you hit record. You can just hit record and off you go. Uh, the AF assist light I turn off because it's annoying and I don't need it. Focus peaking I have off, but I have it set to one of my custom buttons so I can turn it on and off as I need it. Probably not gonna need to use it as much now that we actually have autofocus, but you can change the settings in here. Um, Focus peaking basically works, in fact, I'll show you. I'll switch this to manual focus. I'll turn my focus peaking on. And you can see how all of that blue has appeared around the guitar strings and stuff. That means it's in focus. If I shift it out of focus, that blue goes away. It basically measures the edges of a high contrast area. So when something's in focus, there's contrast between it and the background. Um, and then it will show it up on blue on there so that you can actually see what's going on. So I'll turn that back to manual focus, uh, sorry, automatic focus, and I'll turn the focus peaking back off. Oh, you can also change the color too. I'm, I'm used to blue, I've been using it for years, so I've left it at that. Uh, let's set that off. Uh, okay, the next thing I change is this sound record level display. Um, it's set off by default, but I turn on so that you can see your sound meters down the bottom corner here and you can tell if something's peaking. If you get a loud noise in front of it, you can tell that that's peaked there. Next one, oh, here we go, the sound record gain level. Um, Panasonic has always had pretty hot preamps, so the record level within the, um, within the camera has always been quite high. Now you can actually set it to low so that it has a, like a lower input level so uh, things aren't peaking as easily. I've set it to standard and the reason I've done that is because in the sound record level adjustment you used to only be able to go down to negative 12 dB but now you can go all the way down to negative 18. So I leave it at negative 12 and then if I need to change it down I can change it down to negative 18 and I've got this screen mapped to one of my custom buttons as well. Okay, I leave the uh, sound record level limiter on um, I probably don't need to, but like it's nice to just have that back up. I leave the wind noise cancelor as standard and with the mic socket, for most mics that you will plug into the 3.5mm jack, you'll need to leave it as the plug-in power option. Um, you also have the ability to use the mic level where the camera, where, sorry, where the microphone has its own power or you can use a line level as well but this is the one that most people will be using. Um, if you're using those little Rode shotgun mics or like the uh, Rode wireless goes or something like that, this is the option that you want. All right, most of this next uh, page is for the XLR um, adapter, which goes on the top, which I don't have, so I'm not going to be showing you much in this page. And then the last one here, you've got um, silent mode, which I've left off because, um, I mean, it doesn't really make any noises after you've turned all the beeping off. Image stabilizer, um, it, by default, it's set to this uh, normal mode. You can turn it off if you're on a tripod or something. So I, here's something I've noticed with the Panasonic cameras, and it might be different with the S5 Mark II because I haven't been in this situation yet. 
But if you have this turned on and there's a bit of wind and you just get like a little bit of shake to the camera from the wind hitting the tripod, what can happen is you get this like jello effect in the edges, like, like down in the corner of the image. And it's the stabilizer trying to mitigate the effects of the wind. Whereas if you turn it off, you just get like a little bit of shake, which you can like adjust by it cropping in, in post and the center of the image normally stays exactly where it should. So I leave this on um, because most of my work is handheld. Even if it's on a tripod, I'll normally leave it on unless it's a windy day, in which case I'll turn it off. Um, you also have the ability to set Boost IS in here. Now Boost IS allows you to basically hold it like it's on a tripod. Um, which I have set off, but I've mapped it to a custom button because there are uh, scenarios, say like during bridal prep, where you want it to almost seem like you are on a tripod, but you don't want to like carry a monopod around with you. Um, let's have a look, what else is in here? Uh, this one actually comes in handy, live cropping. Now it's off at the moment, but with live cropping, what you can do is you can set a like a start and an end point so your start point you can see is that um yellow box that's around the guitar and set that and then the end point you can drag around here and then what you do when you hit record is it will actually act almost like a slider so it will crop in and have that start and end point it's actually great for like product videos and things like that but yeah it's a nice little feature to have it's set to off most of the time but it is there if you ever need it and that is everything in that menu. So now let's go across to the settings menu for the um, for the video side of things. So the LUT library is where you can load LUTs in. Um, now, if you're shooting in vlog, you might have a particular monitoring LUT that you enjoy. I'm actually using the gamut LUT to monitor my vlog. And I've used the gamut LUT for a long time because I've found that it's the most color accurate. I'll leave a link in the description down below where you can pick it up if you want to use that um, but yeah you need you need to load it into the LUT library here and then there's another setting later where you need to actually turn it on which I'll show you. Um, ISO increments I leave it set to one third if you leave it set to one then it can bump around your exposure way too much. Um, auto white balance lock setting I'm going to explain that in a bit basically what the auto white balance lock setting is is it allows you to walk into a room with auto white balance on and then lock the white balance to whatever the camera thinks that it should be, which is something that Panasonic didn't have in some of their past videos, uh, sorry, some of their past cameras. And it's pretty, it was, it was disappointing that it didn't have it because it's actually like a super handy feature, but we've got it now. It's in this camera. I've got it set to one of my custom buttons and I'll explain that in a bit. Now the manual focus assist. So this is how this screen normally comes. And what happens is if you touch this ring, it brings up that big magnifying glass in the middle there so that you can see focus. Um, I don't like that because if you're in manual focus and you accidentally bump the lens then it'll actually bring it up. So this focus ring, I turn off and the manual assist, apply, uh, assist display, I set to full, but then I map a custom button so that you can punch in to see focus when you want. And I'll explain that in a bit. Um, manual focus guide, I turn off. Uh, so the assign record to shutter button, um, it's actually in past cameras that has been defaultly turned off, but now it's defaultly turned on. What that means is when you want to record, you can press the shutter button like you would normally take a photo. So I'd leave that on. Um, all of these are off. I think they were all off by default. I'm pretty sure the rest of this page is as standard. Cool. All right, the next menu. Uh, so the Q menu settings is when you're in the normal page and you press this Q menu, um, it gives you a whole bunch of different options. So the Q menu settings, I've actually changed the layout quite a lot. So in this item customization, I have the first one set to exposure mode. I've got the second one set to the record file format. I've got the third one set to record quality, so you can change your frame rates or resolution. Then the photo style, vlog. Then I've got synchro scan on there. I've got peaking. I've got my sound record level adjustment. I've got the boost IS. I've got live cropping if I want to quickly access that. 
I've got the luminance spot meter, zebra patterns, and the waveform vector scopes. Um, now I also have a lot of these mapped to custom buttons, but if I forget which button it's on, I know that I can press the Q menu and I can quickly access it, especially while I'm getting used to this camera as it's a new camera for me. So yeah, that's the Q menu settings, function button settings. Now I'll show you, actually I might go through to the end and then I'll come back to the func function button settings because that is, um, a, a lot of these, I, I haven't actually shown you uh, what they do or are yet. So I'll leave that right to the end. Oh, this one, dial settings. So in the dial settings, basically the standard is the front is your aperture and the rear dial here is your shutter speed. Um, but then the control dial, which is this dial on the back here, that's actually set to be headphone volume by default. So I've changed it to ISO so that when I'm in, like say I'm at an event or something, if I've got my shutter speed, my aperture set where I want it, but it's too dark, like if it's down here, then I can quickly boost it up just by, I can boost it as high or as low as I want just by um, using this dial here. Um, it is easy to bump this dial though, so just be careful. So constant preview I turn on because basically it shows you on the screen constantly what you're going to actually be viewing. Um, the histogram I actually leave turned off. Uh, I don't love having a histogram on the screen all the time. Um, if I want to view my exposure, I'll actually turn my waveform monitor on, which I have mapped to a custom button, which I'll show you later. The photo grid line I turn on, which is basically these lines here, which allows you to, sh uh, to see Make sure that you're framing your image right, using rule of thirds, that sort of thing. Um, live view boost, I leave off, night mode off, LVF monitor display, oh, yeah, no, I leave that as standard. Um, yeah, then we've got focal length, I turn this off. So if you have a zoom lens on and you're changing the focal length, if you have this turned on, it will actually display down the bottom exactly how, um, it will display down the bottom exactly what millimetre that you're at, um, which I actually don't love. It's kind of annoying, so I leave that turned off. But if you want to know what millimetre you're at, you can turn that on, I guess. Uh, these ones I leave off. The level gauge I turn on. So the level gauge is this gauge here, um, which shows you whether you're totally level or not, and clearly this tripod is a little bit unlevel. Uh, luminance spot meter I turn off, but I have it set to a custom button. Now what the luminance spot meter does when you turn it on is it you can move it around the screen and it will tell you, see that that's uh, 2.1 stops underexposed, which makes sense because that's a black area. If I move it here to this really bright area, it'll tell me that it's 4.2 stops overexposed. So I use that um, especially say during bridal prep if um, I'm in a room with mixed lighting and I want to make sure that the bride's face is exposed correctly, um, then I will, yeah, I'll basically use this luminance spot meter and make sure it's at basically perfect exposure. But I have it mapped to a custom button because I don't want it on all the time, so I've got it turned off. Vlog view assist. Now this goes back to the LUT library which I showed you before. Now what this can do is if it's turned on on both monitor, so if it's turned on on the monitor, it's viewing up on this monitor here. If it's turned on on HDMI, it's viewing it on the monitor that you're actually viewing it on. Um, and what this does, this VLOG LUT assist, is it allows you to use this monitoring LUT that we put in the custom library to see how your footage is going to look once it's graded, but it won't bake it into the footage. So this camera actually has the ability to bake LUTs into the footage now, but it's... Um, for me, that's not something I'm ever going to use because it takes flexibility away in post and it really doesn't take that long to like, add the LUTs that you need to later. But to be able to view it in a Rec. 709 color space when you're actually shooting it is super, super handy. So yeah, HLG view assist, same deal, but if you're uh, shooting in HLG, which I don't. Center marker. So this center marker allows you to put a center marker in the middle of the screen if you wanted it. Um, I actually, I don't love it, so I'll leave it off. The safety zone marker. So uh, this allows you to like put a square in the screen if you wanted to leave a safety zone on the outside of what you were shooting, but I don't, so I'll leave that off. Frame markers. So frame markers are, say you're shooting and you know that you're, so you're shooting something that needs to be both vertical and horizontal. 
you can change this frame marker to be like a nine by 16, which is vertical format. Um, and then you can set like a 50% mask. And what that will do when you turn that on is it will actually show you um, which part of the image is actually going to be um, usable for that. And this is where the open gate comes in really handy. So if I change that to open gate, you can see that a lot more of that image is going to be available in that vertical format. But you still have the whole image that you can crop into like a widescreen type thing. So I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to set that back to the 5.9K so I don't forget later. Zebra patterns. So you've got Zebra 1, Zebra 2, and Zebra 1 and 2. So what Zebras do is it gives you a visual indication when you are, I don't know whether you can see that or not, um, but down here there should be stripes. Gives you a visual representation when you go over certain exposure. Now, you can set the exposure. So this, this percentage is roughly translated into an IRE. So I've got the Zebra 2 set to 95 and the Zebra 1, Zebra 1 I would actually normally set to about 65. Now, what that means is if I turn Zebra 2 off and there's uh, Zebras on the screen, then I know that my image could potentially be overexposed. If I turn Zebra 1 on and uh, like I'm looking at skin tones and there's Zebras on the skin tones, then I know that the skin is potentially overexposed. So it's a really handy, um, it's a really handy tool to have. And I have it turned on constantly because I never really want to overexpose my image. Uh, the waveform and vector scope. So uh, if you've played the video before, you know what a waveform is. It's this um, little screen down here. And as you, oops, okay, I'm just gonna make it really big for a sec. Um, so yeah, apparently you can make it smaller if you want, which I've just learned that right now. But as you can see, as you make the image brighter or darker, that waveform moves up and down the screen. And then I don't know whether you can tell whether it's gonna to be too, in fact, I might just drop the exposure on this recording a little bit. But as you go right up, you can see in the right hand side here, that clipping. So it's getting like a flat line on the edge there. And the same as if you dropped it right down, that means you're losing data. So that's where the waveforms can come in really handy because you know if there's no lines, then you know that everything can be recovered in post. I'll just bump this back up. Cool. Uh, now, I actually leave that turned off. Oh, and the vector scope kind of uh, shows you the colors. So, but it's actually really tiny and it's not super easy to see. And there's probably not a lot you can do about the colors short of going in and actually like manipulating them in the white balance menu. So, I normally leave this turned off, but I have a custom button set to my waveforms. Uh, the red record frame indicator I have turned on. Now what that means is when you start to record, you get this big red uh, box around the screen. It's really handy if you're running multiple cameras because it means that you can have a really quick look and you can tell even from a distance whether the camera is recording or not. Uh, HDMI record output, um, at the moment this doesn't matter because there is no raw recording over HDMI. Um, if there was this info display, you'd want to turn off, uh, otherwise all of the information that's on the screen here will also be baked into the footage that you're recording, which would be annoying. Fan mode, um, I've just left this set to auto too, this might change over time. I've not heard the fan go off in the camera at all, so I don't think it's going to matter that much. Uh, lens focus resume, I turn on, uh, because what this does is if you turn the camera off, if you're, in ma sorry, if you're in manual focus, if you turn the camera off and then you turn it back on again, it will basically pick up wherever the focus was uh, the last time. Uh, the focus ring control, I set to linear, because uh, basically if it's on linear, then it means that it will behave more like a regular manual lens, where if it's set to non-linear, then the faster, you speed, the faster you spin it, the quicker it will focus, which is not very intuitive and it's really easy to miss focus. Whereas if, it, if it's in linear, you know, if you turn it a quarter of a turn, you're getting a quarter of a turn on the lens in focus. Um, let's have a look. Oh, no, and then we're back to the start. 
And yeah, so then the only other menu here is your um, your custom menu. If you wanted to add things that you use a lot of the time into that, then you can add them into that. So you wanted to add your aspect ratio, then when you go back into here, you can quickly as uh, access aspect ratio. So yeah, uh, the last thing I'll go over is my custom custom menu buttons, which are in here, the function button set. So we want to setting in record mode. And so you can see at the top here, so the white balance button, which is the first button, uh, it says WB, it's still mapped to white balance. The ISO button, which I never use because I've got ISO mapped to this ring, I've actually changed to be synchro scan. So I can turn that on and off quickly. Um, if I need to, like if I notice that there's like some fairy lights or something that are flickering, I can turn that on and adjust it until they stop flickering. Um, the next button, which is the exposure control, which really does nothing normally in a um, when you're shooting video, especially when you're shooting video in manual mode. So this exposure control I've set to be automatic white, white balance lock. So if I'm here, I'm in automatic white balance, and then I press this button here, you can see up in the top corner here, AWBL has popped up. What that means is now no matter where I turn the camera, the white balance will be locked to what it was when it was in auto white balance. Then the record button on the top here, the big red button, I've actually mapped to the punch in zoom. So if I press that, it will actually punch in and then I can set focus. You can make that bigger or smaller. Um, and this also works while you're recording. So if you are, uh, and you can move it around as well. So if you are, uh, say you're at a wedding and you're in the center aisle and it's kind of hard to nail critical focus when you're in the center aisle on a wider, wider lens, um, even while you're recording, you can press that button and it'll punch in and then you can make sure that your subjects are in focus. Uh, the next one, AF on, I've left as AF on. The, um, the button that changes the focus modes, I've left as that. The LVF button, I've left as LVF. The Q menu button, I've left as Q menu. But the back button down the bottom here, I've changed to boost IS. Now, the boost IS button, uh, as I said before, it allows you to hold it and it appears as though it's on a tripod. So, yeah. Then the next page, there's actually a button, I'll turn this around. There's a button on the front of the camera just here. Um, this button down here is the lens release button, which I wish Panasonic would put on this side of the camera because it's really easy to accidentally hit. But this button here, I've actually got mapped to be my um, sound level adjustments. So, I can easily press that button and it'll bring it up here. So if I notice that if I was talking really quietly and you can see that the levels are quite low, then I can boost that up as I'm talking to uh, get those levels to peak around about negative six dB. But the same as if somebody was talking really loudly, you can bump it back down to be wherever it is. So it's um, hitting that kind of yellow area around that negative six dB mark. So yeah, that is that button there. Setting in record mode. And yeah, that's all my custom buttons. All right, guys, sorry about that. I've just realized as I've been edi editing this video that I missed an entire page of those custom uh, buttons. So um, and on the back of the camera, on that scrolly pad, if you push in different directions, they're actually buttons as well. So if you push up on that scroll pad, I've got that set to zebras, which is FN8 there. Um, and that is uh, cycles between zebra one, zebra two, and turning the zebras off. If you press the right hand side of that button, that'll turn the waveforms on and off on the back screen. If you press down on that pad, it'll turn the peaking on and off. And if you press right on that pad, it will turn the luminance spot meter on or off. So yeah guys, I hope you found that useful. Um, I spent a long time going through and figuring this all out and I'm sure that uh, some of the settings that I'm using will change in the future. And if there's anything major, um, I'll do an update to this video, especially if uh, we get extra features through firmware updates or things like that. But yeah, hope you guys found it useful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and please consider subscribing because there's going to be a lot more S5 Mark II content coming out in the future. And yeah, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye.